in 76, but in 1796, it is necessary to make change, specifically to make, quote, property productive of national blessing, extending to every individual, not just a few. Are we in times that try our souls? For sure. Let's hear it. Are we? Yeah. Are we in revolutionary times? Yes. That's the question we're going to address today. Mother Kelly has called our freedom dreams, she said, need not bear the imprint of compromise. So, ask away, compromise not. To address all of this and more, we have Richard Wolf, Professor of Economic Emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, visiting professor at the New School Graduate Program, author of many wonderful books, including Democracy at Work, A Cure for Capitalism, Occupy the Economy, Challenging Capitalism, and Capitalism Hits the Fan, The Global <laughs> Economic Meltdown and What to Do About It. He also hosts the wonderful weekly economic update on WBAI-FM in New York. Chris Hedges spent 20 years as a foreign correspondent, 15 of those for the New York Times, where he was part of a team that won a Pulitzer Prize until he denounced the Bush administration's call to invade Iraq and <laughs> lost his post at the Times. He's the author of the bestsellers Empire of Illusion, War is a Force that Gives Us Meaning, and Death of the Liberal Class. And he writes a weekly column that you must read for the website Truth Day. Man in the Life of the Mind. <laughs> now at Union Theological Seminary, he's best known for his classic Race Matters, Democracy Matters, and his memoir, Brother West, Living and Loving Out Loud. He appears frequently on many programs when they let him, as well as on his dear brother Tavis Smiley's PBS TV show. He can be heard weekly with Tavis on Smiley and West. The National Public Radio program distributed by Public Radio International, and I believe also heard on WPAM. Thank you all. We will um, uh, wonderful Gina Kim here has distributed cards. If you have questions, you should write those questions on the card. We do not, absolutely do not guarantee to answer all your questions. But we will um, sort through, discover some themes, and pose some questions to the speakers, um, once they've laid out their argument for about 45 minutes, I'll get a chance to pose a couple of questions of my own, and we'll uh, have you out of here in 19 minutes. Great theorists, we have uh, almost none. Uh, Payne may be uh, the only one. Uh, in many ways, he was the first uh, intellectual in the sense that he never tied himself to a political party. He was always in opposition to power. Uh, and I thought I'd open the discussion uh, with Rick and Cornell uh, by uh, highlighting some of his major strengths, ones that I think we can learn from. Uh, the first would be that Paine, in a way that uh, many of the uh, uh, four uh, figures of the revolution were not, uh, understood the monarchy, understood British power. He didn't come to the United States until he was 37. And part of his job, in common sense, was to explain the structures of power to the colonies. Uh, who didn't understand them. Even figures like Benjamin Franklin, uh, up until the very last moment, wanted to build a rapprochement with uh, the king. Uh, and Payne, it was part of Payne's job at, to explain why this wasn't possible. And I think one of the things that uh, I think all three of us probably feel, and I'll stop in a second and, and let you both address this, is that uh, there has been a misreading on the part of the American left and even among the progressive community of the structures of power and for that reason it has rendered us impotent. We have effectively been channeling our energy back into a dead political system. Uh, I wrote uh, many of Nader's major speeches for him in the 2008 election and going back to 2008 um, there were a lot of people in the left forum who had uh, drunk the Kool-Aid for Barack Obama. And I think that that was because they had uh, quite been diverted quite effectively into the personal narrative of a candidate, which is irrelevant uh, uh, in terms of understanding the mechanisms of power. And just as Paine understood that the imperial power of the British uh, uh, had essentially blinded itself, that, that its hubris 
uh, made it incapable of listening, which is why you had one of the largest armadas, uh, 350 ships sent on New York. Uh, I think we are in a very similar moment as well. And uh, maybe begin, Cornell, with you and talk a little bit about the, that idea of structural power. Uh, yeah. Did you want to say something, Brother Wolf, before I say something? Okay. Uh, I think it's, for me, it's not just a question of that structural power. It's true that, that Thomas Paine uh, comes at, 30, at 37 years old to the new world and already has a critique of not just good and bad kings, but of monarchy as a whole. So he's talking about a structural systemic analysis that most of the Americans at the time had not moved toward. That in 1776, there were over 400 pamphlets published. The one pamphlet we still read, Common Sense. So there's a number of voices being lifted. But here, this 37-year-old who arrives lays bare this critique of the structural power. But keep in mind who he was. His father was a Quaker. He, had, he inherited a fundamental solidarity with the downtrodden, with those who were excluded. That he was willing always to cut radically against the grain, and his conception of himself at 37 was he was going to die, or he was going to be willing to die, if he, ensuring that he would act honorably, think critically, that he would be willing to sacrifice his popularity for truth and justice, and would always fuse with other folk on the ground in grassroots movements. And so even as he lays bare this critique of structural power, he has a conception of himself that is Quaker-like. I mean, he was not an atheist, he was a deist. He hated organized religion, he hated dogma, especially religious dogma, but also ideological dogma, and viewed himself as First and foremost, a member of those slash known called everyday people. He was a commoner to the core, and he engaged in a revolutionary act in how he wrote, not just what he wrote, because how he wrote was a critique of the pomposity and the obscurity of the Latin, of the Latin Greek, obsessed language of the Ur Edmund Burks and others. That he was going to speak a language that was so clear, he said, I want to write as plain as the alphabet for common folk because I come out of the common folk. So that was a revolution in form and style. And it was the first time that folk who hardly could read at all could be read to and get through a language that was part of their colloquial style, that was part of how they communicated going back to the artisanal class. He was not working class. He was an artisanal class in, in Thetford Village there in, in, in Norfolk. But he fundamentally identified with the common folk. What we don't have today is we don't have intellectuals. He was the first American modern intellectual unconnected. No doubt about that. What we don't have today are intellectuals who have not been seduced by the professional managerial carriage and the subculture of the university who are fundamentally committed to the plight and predicament of commoners, everyday people, working people, poor people, and view their calling, not their career, as having an organic connection with their struggles, no matter how strong or no matter how weak they are. Now, there are some intellectuals that do that fewer and fewer and fewer. Why? Because what Thomas Paine didn't have to deal with is the backdrop of impending ecological catastrophe, the backdrop of possible nuclear catastrophe, the fashionable character of being cynical and despairing even as you are highly professionally approved and recognized. The sipping tea in the cafes with a sharp analysis, but no willingness to pay a cost, no willingness to take a risk, no willingness, no willingness to cut radically against the grain. And of course, he dealt with the consequences. You told me he died right here in Greenwich Village, 72 years old, six people at his funeral, two of them black, because that critique of African slavery, the first piece he wrote in March of 1775, was real. That led toward the founding of the first anti-abolitionist society in the new world. He was 
fundamentally committed to a critique of white supremacy, very rare oftentimes among highly visible white intellectuals. Brother Chris is rare. Stanley Rodham is rare. Rick Wolf rare. Eric Foner rare. We can go, we, we can call the list because the list's so short. Pick up on something. <laughs> just did. Uh, when Laura was still speaking before we started, she asked how much change was needed or some words to that effect. And it was a strong, clear statement. Yes. And she asked about revolution. Much less strong. Much more wobbling. Now, Tom Paine is exactly about that difference. Just as the name of this conference, the name we chose for this conference is Reform and Revolution, faced with a situation that's becoming more and more unequal, unfair, unjust, and intolerable, what are we going to do? And what Paine, for me, what makes him stand out is the care that he takes to go right after that question. And the way I hear it is this. We now face, he says about his time, more than enough evidence, decade upon decade, of accumulated outrages, injustices, attacks on our freedoms, our rights, and our security. In a sense, we've tried to address this one and that one, to work out an accommodation here, to get a reform over there. We've been there, and we've done it, and it hasn't worked. And we gotta face that. We can't make reforms most of the time because the power structure arrayed against us blocks us. But even worse, when occasionally we get a reform, that same power structure having lost the effort to block it, now goes to work to undo it, to reverse it, and to go right back to where they were. Therefore, the conclusion Payne reaches and tries to teach the American people then is the same one I think many of us want to teach now. You've got to change the system. Not because it's an alternative to being achieving reforms, but because changing the system is the only way to make a reform that's durable. <laughs> Revolution is the way you complete the reform process, just as it's the condition for the reforms you get to last and to mean what you wanted them to mean when you fought for them. That's why the word revolution rang in Paine's work so powerfully. It's a big change. Not this, not that. We have to say to the King of England, go home. You're out of here. It's over. The British Empire, hundreds of years of dominance. We, we quit. We're gone. You're out of here. A powerful ending of the colonial relationship that gave this country its modern birth, its whole history. An amazing thing to say to the people to separate. And yet, aren't we in the same? Isn't that the legacy for us too? To finally say, and let me pick up on one theme here, because I know many of you have encountered references to, or if you have a lot of time, you've read the book by Thomas Piketty. A lot of time, it's 600 pages, it takes a long time. And he's a good economist, but as a writer, hmm, not so much. Uh, yes, it's a, in our profession, that's absolutely normal. Um, the, but his point is the same, isn't it? He says he studied capitalism for 250 years. He and his colleague Saez in, in California at Berkeley are the go-to statisticians to understand the distribution of wealth and income in the world these days. And his conclusion in that book, Capital in the 21st Century, is that capitalism inherently, anywhere and everywhere it has been established, produces as its inherent tendency a growing inequality of wealth and income. Periodically, he points out, People get so freaked by this that they push back, and we have a reform. 
And then as soon as it's over, the same capitalism undoes the reform. Uh, we all know that, don't we, here in the United States? Because the last 40 years is the undoing of the New Deal. There it is, again. And so pain comes to us. And when Chris said to me initially, let's start with Thomas Paine, now I see what was in his mind. He is teaching us, you've got to have the courage to make a systemic change. You've been to the reform table. You've tried it repeatedly. You have to learn the lesson. We are at the stage of taking a major new step. So of course we're a little nervous, as your hesitant comments to Laura indicated. But the logic now is something we can understand thanks to pains pushing through the way Chris and Cornell just said. I think the, the thing about pain that's also very important, and Cornell alluded to this, is language. Um, what the linguists call mutual knowledge. Um, and Pinker has written, Stephen Pinker has written about this, that uh, language is a vehicle by which reality uh, is filtered through to you. And part of Paine's power, which is the power of all great revolutionary writers, is that he utterly upended that language to the uh, extent that he redefined terms like democracy. Democracy was a pejorative. Republicanism, or the republic, was a pejorative. And Paine reclaimed those words and gave them a new definition. The other thing, which Cornell also mentioned, which is important about Paine, is that he spoke in the language, or he wrote in the language, of everyday people. Now, um, that, as a writer, is deceptive, um, because it's actually extremely difficult. Um, Orwell mastered that capacity. Orwell once said that, you know, I want, as a writer, I want to be that clear window pane by which people can see through. And Paine did that. Uh, and when he writes his response to Edmund Burke uh, in uh, The Rights of Man, uh, he goes after uh, Burke's very florid style. And I think language, and I'll you know, want to raise this with both of you, is extremely important because we live in a society now where those who have power have created specialized vocabularies that shut the rest of us out. Economists have been particularly good at this, um, but just about the technocrat, and we, and, and we are ruled by technocrats, uh, has created a specialized vocabulary that those of us on the outside are not able to penetrate. And that becomes a kind of barrier in terms of our ability to exercise our rights as citizens to influence power. And Paine understood that extremely well, um, and it's why his writings were so effective. He, he's an incredible writer. I mean, Common Sense is arguably one of the greatest essays in English. Um, when he writes uh, The Rights of Man, especially the second part, and, and it becomes extremely important because in that second part of The Rights of Man, he actually outlines the whole welfare state. Um, and the Pitt government goes nuts, William Pitt, uh, and they pass uh, the two-act law, which uh, bans um, just as we see in the wake of the Occupy movement, bans large public gatherings, uh, makes it a lot easier to prosecute people for treason. Uh, Payne himself is tried for sedition and has to flee to France. I mean, his amazing life, he ends up as a, one of two foreign delegates in the National Convention, stands up and opposes the regicide of Louis XVI, the Jacobins turn on him, he ends up in prison. Um, uh, but when he writes The Rights of Man, he gives to the English working class, and you have to remember that the working class in England at the time was in far worse economic state than the white working class in the United States. Uh, three out of four or, um, uh, people in uh, large metropolitan cities in Europe were either paupers or beggars. Uh, and, and when the Pitt government, it creates all sorts of uh, uh, worker organizations that begin to discuss political issues. The Pitt government shuts it down and drives it underground. But I think, and E.P. Thompson makes this point, that one of the reasons Paine is actually better known in England is because he gave them the whole vocabulary to the, to the kind of working class radical labor movement. And I think that that's an extremely important issue. And I, and I think that this gets to Rick's point 
is people's reaction, is that we are still in a process of searching for the language by which we can, number one, describe the political and social and economic reality that we are enduring and how to respond. Mm -hmm. And I think at the center of that revolution and forward style of Thomas Paine was a genuine anger, a righteous indignation of the conditions of the people that he was fundamentally working alongside and struggling alongside with. Remember the line 24a of Plato's Apology? Socrates says, Parisia was the cause of my unpopularity. Parisia is plain speech, unintimidated speech, frank speech, speech that is unafraid. It's the language of the great Victoria Garvin of Malcolm X. It's the language of Dorothy Day, of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. It cuts through the jargon. It cuts through specialized language. It gets at the pain but doesn't remain there because it articulates a vision so that there's an alternative to that pain. That is also what's lacking. And that's what Thomas Paine had. And part of the problem is when we, when we do have persons with those voices, what happens? Well, Thomas Paine went to jail in London. He's pushed out. He's 11 months in prison in Paris, luckily makes it out. When he comes back here, he has a critique of George Washington. He has a critique of evangelical religion in the midst of the first awakening. And he is completely pushed aside. So oftentimes, persons who have these voices are either in prison, incarcerated, lied on, character assassinated, literally assassinated, or just pushed to the margins and viewed as some isolated icon that one worships rather than views them as part of a movement. Oscar Lopez Rivera. We go on and on and on in this regard. You see. So the challenge is how do we build on Paine's example? But we're living in a much more crypto fascist state than he was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the lesson of Brother Mumia and others. Those who raise their voices, the national surveillance state, the national security state is on you. The spies are operating. Folk on the inside, your friends who used to, you thought you could rely on, no, not at all. They're cowardly. They're too conformist. They're too complacent. Who do you rely on then? That's what Thomas Paine was wrestling with most of his life. He dedicates one of the texts to George Washington, right? Next thing you know, George won't get him out of the clinker in Paris. He's living with James Madison in Paris. Then the critique of George Washington is so devastating. George Washington is the icon. When he comes to the state, they won't touch Thomas Paine with a 10-foot foot pole because his critique of George Washington is so unrelenting, he has pulled the cover on the demagogue. Nobody talks about George. He chopped down the cherry tree. Here, let's be clear. All the people who turned against him along the way, the vast majority of them, we don't even know who they are. What survived was what this man wrote. And it didn't just survive because he was a great writer. He was. And it didn't just survive because he found ways of changing the meaning of words that brought people alive. Incredible skills. Chris is right. One of the great writers, particularly the great writers of revolutionary literature. The reason, though, he survives is that it's the same question. And when you begin to look as Chris and, and we did, for what we could build a lasting conversation around, we found him because he addresses the same issue. What is to be done, if I could borrow the way another important leader posed the question, uh, what is to be done? This, this is his recognition. And I think we ought to be, for a moment, proud that the United States produced such a person. Proud that we generated someone who could pose the reform and revolution question so dramatically that even though his coming down on the side of revolution, which frightens so many people, returns now to something we want to talk about and that we want you to return to read and learn from as we have because there's lots of very powerful insight in there about what it is we face now. And we do in this country face now 
an extraordinary structure that has done the things that were so upsetting to, to pain. One example that was referred to by both of us, uh, all of us. Democracy in those days was a word that looked akin to chaotic, disorganized, messy, ineffective, negative, negative, negative. Right? We live, in a sense, in a bizarre reversal. Now, it's the holy of holies. But it's all a fake. We celebrated democracy the way we celebrate cowboys in the old days. A complete fantasy, a makeup, so that we can indulge this desire. As an economist, I keep saying this, and I know some of you have heard it from me before. We go to work, we spend five out of seven days a week at our jobs. And when we go to work, which is where we spend most of our adult life, we enter a place in a capitalist society that is the absolute opposite of democracy. A tiny group of people, major shareholders and boards of directors, 25, 30 people, make all the decisions that thousands of employees, not to speak of the communities where these employees work, have to live with. Their participation in those decisions is completely excluded, in principle, in law, and in fact. So we spend most of our adult lives in an institution that is fundamentally undemocratic and pretend we live in a society with a fundamental commitment to democracy. This is crazy. <laughs> but it's a craziness that has to be opened up by the genius kind of vision that a pain brings to it so that you kind of shock a population into recognizing that all along, that's what's been bothering me. It isn't just that I'm poor. It isn't just that I'm living in a polluted environment in an overcrowded city. It's that I'm not treated like a human being. And this is, this is revolutionary stuff. That moment of recognition, if you can help it along with the kind of writing he had, that lights the fire. It's very, very powerful. I want to talk about the two weapons that were used against pain most effectively. Uh, the first was vilification. Uh, and when you stand up and speak a truth as powerfully and eloquently as pain does, the state, uh, and this was true both in colonial America and especially true in uh, the England of William Pitt, and even finally in uh, the Jacobin uh, revolutionary France, where they were terrified of Paine's writing, which is why he ends up in the Luxembourg. And he doesn't just end up in the Luxembourg, he's slated for execution. Uh, and the only reason he's not executed is because they would mark the doors of the people to be guillotined the next morning. And his door, the door to his cell was open, and they marked the inside of the door. And at night, the guard closed it. And he sat in the room, holding his breath, waiting as the guards passed to pull those people out of the Luxembourg who would be guillotined and they passed him by. That's the only reason Payne is alive. And there's actually an amazing scene where Danton, who had uh, been an ally of Payne, is brought to the Luxembourg and they embrace uh, before Danton is executed. Um, so vilification, uh, there he was followed. Uh, the government, uh, as they do here, funded all sorts of front organizations, letter writing campaigns, uh, and they destroyed him. Uh, and that the power of vilification should not be uh, diminished, it works. Uh, and Payne was being burned in effigy uh, by the very people that he was writing for. Uh, in France, of course, he almost dies because he opposes the reign of terror. He was a Quaker. In that sense, he wasn't a good Quaker. They wouldn't let him be buried, finally, in a Quaker burial. But he 